Olaf Blanke, he's the founding director of the Center for Neuroprosthetics at the APFL, the Swiss Institute of Technology in Lausanne. He has played quite interesting tricks with the people who have participated in his experiments using virtual reality avatars and other technologies. He's here to tell us about it. Please welcome Olaf Blanke. I'd like to share two dreams, um, two personal dreams with you today. One is, as a neuroscientist, to get a full understanding of self-consciousness, the sensation of identity, and that there's a special meaning when experiences relate to us, a very human um, experience. And then a second dream is, how can we understand, or once we have understood this representation, and join or team up with engineers, how can we make use of this for and this is a, is a dream as a neurologist for um, patient conditions. So compared to the other revolutions that you've heard about, very invasive many of them, I'll talk to you about three revolutions. Um, the first slide here, we had an explosion of brain imaging data that can now be measured non-invasively in human subjects. So I'm a person working directly with humans using also those advances as coming from the field of physics to visualize brain activity. And you see on this first slide these major advances measuring the structure of the brain non-invasively, the connections of the brain and brain activity. And then as Miguel has shown you also different ways of non-invasively measuring in different even movement states brain electricity. There's a second revolution and that's robotics. And you've seen it again in the last presentation. And you see again, this is from a very early robot arm in the 60s to, as you can see also here, going to more and more portable system. And this is what we call wearable robotics. Now, ideally, this is in the form of electronic skins as clothing that will have robotic capacities. And this is upper limb robotics. And you see the same has happened in the field of locomotion robotics, where static systems, passive systems are now getting more and more wearable. The extreme form here, very interesting, is Honda. You can already buy these today. It's a third leg system helping elderly people. I think this will be a reality very quickly in the next uh, four years. Something that will have to happen in the near future is to bring these technologies of today, lightweight and wearable, to clinical conditions. These are different conditions. Cognitive deficits, anxiety deficits, height phobia, social phobia, where well, this has been tested but it has not been brought to the clinic. The proof of principle was there, but the industry is missing to make that step happen. Also, the, the intensive interaction between engineering, neuroscience, and, and, um, and, and medicine. So again, these are very heavy weight uh, robotic engineering solutions. I think Google is leading the way here, and, and, and also at EPFL, we have a, a very strong group on this. Head mounted display should not be a heavy thing you carry on your head. I, eventually, it will be just a pair of glasses, smart glasses that you will wear. And we've seen a wonderful demonstration at Kaust yesterday as well that cave systems will be the, on the other end of what virtual reality can, can be used and really generate alternative worlds. So back to the, to, uh, to the title of my talk, what is neuroprosthetics of the mind or what are cognitive neuroprosthetics? The principles we want to understand are the same. We want to understand neuroscience principles and engineering principles of how the brain deals with cognitive processing. And the second goal is, this is my second dream, to translate this into revolutions in healthcare. And another interesting, important point for us, also for the general population, the elderly population. What can we do for them? And this is the topic, cognitive enhancement. Now, I could have talked about many of these things, attention, memory, language, thought, those are the typical fields of research for cognitive neuroscience. What my lab has worked on, and it's a very tight link to what Miguel Nicolelis has talked to you about, but in the field, in, in, in human subjects, is bodily processing, sensory representations, motor representations, and their relevance for self-consciousness. In the next five slides, I will take you a bit into the field of cognitive neuroscience of this self. 
So what is the self is this definition here that I show you a very simple definition that the self is different from the world, different from other human beings. But what we're trying to, what I will show you in the next five slides is there's this conscious experience to us. There's this feel to being a certain person and this goes to an action. If I move my right hand in this way, well, I am moving this hand. But what is this I? How is the brain generating this most fundamental feeling of being a human being that we protect in society? That's when we show our passport. That's the entity we're talking about. Um, and of course, it's not just action, but also looking through the room, looking, seeing the blue color and seeing the screen. These are conscious experiences of what? Well, of me, the subject of experiences. Now, traditionally, people have looked at these these aspects, memory, autobiographical memory, life events, thinking. I show you an image of René Descartes here, probably the most famous philosopher due to his work on particular this issue in Western um, philosophy of mind. So moving towards visual representation of the self as a mirror exposure, what we are part of or what much of our research has looked at, these automatic integrations of bodily signals and what they could mean for consciousness, particular self-consciousness. Phantom limbs is probably the best example to show you what I mean with this principle. So this gentleman has lost the upper arm and 95% of these individuals will perceive the persistence of a hand, a phantom limb or a phantom hand. And the striking thing is this is felt as flesh-like as the physically existing hand. And um, as the second image here, you can also manipulate this hand. So seeing a hand in a mirror overlapped here over the left, in this case of another patient, the left arm, in many cases changes the sensations of phantom limbs. Now these are patient data showing that brain representation here, the representation of this no longer existing hand in the left hemisphere of this patient generates the conscious experience of being or of having a hand. How do we study this uh, in the research laboratory? And this is the work by uh, Botvinnik Cohen. Uh, Butvinik and Cohen that, that Miguel has shown you in, uh, in, in the previous presentation. I show you a video because I think it shows it very nicely. The experimental subject is sitting here looking at a fake hand right here. And um, let me play it again one more time. So what is important is really that the stroking is felt at this hand, is seen at this hand, and that they are applied synchronously. And if you do this for a minute, this blue subject will feel that this is his hand. And as you see, he pulls it. It's a strong association. So this hand is pulled off, whereas the left hand or the, the, the right hand where the aggression was coming should have remained. So there is this association that is created. So it's really, from the brain's point of view, applying the stroking systematically for two minutes, the fake hand position takes over, in the brain at least, the position of the physical a limp. And then there is also several um, um, research papers showing that there is a dedicated frontoparietal system that gets activated in the case of false uh, body ownership. Where is my hand? Where do I feel my hand? And where do I see my hand? And interestingly enough, those neurons change firing properties if you apply the stimulation mechanisms. So we can study this in a very fine-grained manner also in these animals. What was more important for us, this is a collaboration with Wolfram Gerstner at EPFL, to build a mathematical model of ownership. When does it break down? How big does the distance need to be between these conditions? And here we needed to apply many, many, many repetitions to our subjects in order to build a mathematical model which behaves just like an individual human being in our experiments. And you see here that the red line and the, uh, the, the green data behave very similarly. But this is different now. We can build a model and can pr predict how uh, that subject um, 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 works. But it's also what is happening. It's like what Miguel, Miguel presented, that there is an extension of the body from the, the, the surgeon, which is sitting at a distance, could be two continents apart, and extension of the body to this patient. What we are looking at this research project is how can neuroscience impact the next design and particularly haptics and how it's integrated in those medical robots and what can we learn as a neuroscientist about this new function. This is a brain function that has never existed in humans before. 
these stellar operations. But I want to go back to consciousness because actually I haven't talked to you about this magical entity at all, self-consciousness and the self. This is an arm attributed to the self or not. What we have seen here is that showing an avatar as in this movie that you will see here now not applied between a fake hand and a real hand but between my body here and a body filmed from behind. So this body, this is the experiment of the body, not the arm, is filmed by this camera and projected on a small head-mounted display that this person is, is wearing here. So you see a body standing two meters in front where you see the touch applied, whereas you feel the touch, of course, where, where the experiment applies. And we see the same phenomenon. The brain represents the body just as it does represent the hand. And we can induce two states. First of all, I feel and the brain starts representing the seen body as my body. The avatar takes over if you want. And then there is a recalibration also. And now you don't recalibrate where your arm is with respect to your body. You recalibrate where your brain represents the center of awareness in, in space. And, and also record brain signals. And what is happening, this is interesting also for the second part of my, my talk, which are these uh, these uh, applications to clinical work is that we see a change in touch perception. There is a drop in body temperature of our participants when embodying this virtual representation. They support more pain. There is an analgesia and also there is a, is a decrease in allergic uh, um, um, reactions. Now we'll be moving faster on the next two slides. We are of course as a neuroscientist also interested in understanding using another kind of robotics um, in the fMRI environment, activating in healthy subjects this red region here, for example, and learning more about this region as compared to patient data where some dissociations occur spontaneously. So to sum up this, this, this part, so self-consciousness seems to be much simpler than we actually thought. We have a clear understanding how very basic aspects can be manipulated and controlled. Um, in phantom limb pain, I've showed you this image before, this is the normal representation of the face, the hand, and the upper arm. So there is a shrinkage and disappearance of the region that previously represented the arm, and this is supposed to give rise to phantom limb pain. And what we have done in this one project um, at the Center for Neuroprosthetics in amputee patients is collaboration with Silvestro Michera, where here the feedback is not giving to um, a seen hand, um, but it's directly given, the stroking is directly given in this left uh, upper limb uh, amputee to residual nerves after the amputation in the arm. And this is another project with the Rehabilitation Institute, again in amputee patients, as Todd Kuykens um, um, work, where there is a different interface, not with the peripheral nervous system, but here to the chest muscle and the chest skin. So touch applied in these differently colored regions elicits sensory of phantom finger sensation. So what we're looking in this project is where, with a ultra-high scanner at EPFL, which parts of the brain are activated. Because treatments that we will develop using also stimulation is to, to alter this uh, representation that be, because we know that pathological plasticity-related changes in this brain representation are the cause of phantom limb pain. So we want to uh, map these non-invasively with a one millimeter cube a resolution and then can, can study them in patients such as these in order to treat um, phantom limb pain. Another application, a very frequent condition, over 4 million um, stroke survivors in the US living today, where we want to, where we want to use another illusion that Bruno Herbelin has built in the lab, where we don't even need to apply tactile stimulation linked to our visual stimulation, but here we're recording the ECG-based um, 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 brain, uh, sorry, uh, heart activity, and we're animating the visual arm with this automatic signal in order to break pathological pain pathways uh, circling through the brain and not only interacting with a, with a sensory pathway, but also with a pain pathway and with a visual pathway. Again, this is not enough. We have to bring other tools. We have to bring brain-computer interfaces and interact this. And this is what we're doing at the Center for Neuroprosthetics, interacting very closely with the work with a group of Josie Milan. We are developing continuously our virtual reality tools. And this is a new project supported by the W Science um, Foundation to, to develop the next level of these virtual reality 
um, animations. And as you can see here, this is not just of relevance for health, uh, for, for disease, but it's also for developing and enabling technologies um, for healthy subjects, as you can see here, potentially for gaming, um, but also for rehabilitation training in, in elderly people, for example. Now, of course, I focused very much on non-invasive uh, uh, treatments, and I think it's important to push this line of work because the number of patients we will reach with sophisticated treatments is much higher as if we would put all our energy on invasive treatments. But of course, it is important, having seen the beautiful work of, of, of Professor Ben Abid uh, this morning, is that of course we will have the possibility to integrate many of these manipulations with invasive brain stimulations. Not only in Parkinson's disease, but closed loop scenarios are also being developed for epilepsy approaches using DBS, as we have heard, at the level of the thalamus or the, or the subthalamic nucleus, but also at the level of cortical closed loop systems. And I've talked already much for stroke rehabilitation about robotics and um, brain computer interfaces. So these, just to say a few more, or put a few more names at the Center for Neuroprosthetics, this is not only my research, this is what we're doing, and this is unique putting together neuroscientists, engineers, and medical doctors at an engineering school and have projects between our labs. So this is the key aspect that not each one is pushing. We've, we've heard the name of professors and egos. This is getting five egos together at one particular location with the key strategic uh, technology industry and, and, and clinical partners. So I, I finish with, um, with this slide. So this is uh, at the Center for Neuroprosthetics. This is the EPFL in Lausanne. This is uh, Geneva. And this will be our fascinating new campus where um, not only the Center for Neuroprosthetics, which is hopefully going to grow over the next uh, two, three years by another 60 or 70 colleagues um, or so, but where we're also interacting with the University of Geneva and a new major initiative, the VIS Center, where other aspects of engineering and neuroscience uh, will join. And I stop by, by really saying that this dream of putting neuroscience and neuroengineering together for medical application is really a key that needs to be realized. But we need to do more than talking about it. This needs to be represented in the structure. You need to find your neighbor for a coffee. You need to have the medical experts there and the next generation of young MDs, uh, engineers, and neuroscientists who take these um, ideas further. So having this understanding or having these kind of research teams, I think we will have a chance to understand basic brain functions. So this is the, 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 the wish of the neuroscientists to understand in the cognitive neurosciences self-consciousness, but also attention or memory, which would be, be another talk where we, where we have to be more active to develop these devices and to really take the step, not just to have a proof of principle study, but to really take it to spin-offs um, and, and, and companies that take this um, to the patient. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Blanke. Thank you very much.